the Buddha's basic image for the, his teaching was of a path, something you do. And it's important to keep that in mind. His focus is on actions. Even when he talks about insight, there's a word, yata puta dasana, yana dasana, which is sometimes translated as seeing things as they really are. But it really means seeing things as they've come to be, as they function, as they act. For instance, the main teaching is dependent core rising, and it's all about actions. This causes that, that causes this. And as for what's behind that, the Buddha said, don't ask. Is there somebody doing these things? No. It doesn't say yes or no. Just don't ask that question. Focus on the activities. So right now, focus on what you're doing. And as far as the question is, who are you, put that aside. The only extent to which you think about you is that this is something you have to do, and nobody else is going to do this for you. But you are capable of doing it. Sometimes you run into the you that says, I can't do this, I'm a miserable meditator. And then you see the things going wrong in your meditation, and it just proves what you had decided on beforehand. That just is a huge block. Because what is the Buddha asking you? He's asking you to be mindful, which keeps something in mind, something you can do, and to just do it consistently. That's where it's new. Do it more consistently than you have before. Keep the breath in mind. But how do you do that? It's each breath at a time, one at a time. You don't have to do the whole hour right now. You do right now, right now, and that you can do. The next breath comes, you can do that. next breath comes, you can do that. You're capable of doing this, and you're going to benefit. Whatever suffering you're causing yourself right now, that will end at the end of it, when you're achieve the goal. And you'll find that a lot of suffering falls away, a lot of stress falls away as you're practicing. You can see this very clearly as you're working with the breath. You begin to realize as you breathe in, breathe out, there are patterns of tension in different parts of the body. And if you think of the breath flowing through them, they begin to dissolve away. So you're competent and you will benefit from this. And you're going to learn a lot. But people ask me, how do I know when my breathing is comfortable? I'll say, whatever is good enough for you right now, stick with that. And then as your concentration gets more solid, you get more sensitive. And what was good enough before is not quite so good, any, good enough after all. Well, you can improve it. Breathe in ways that are more subtle, breathe in ways that are more satisfying. You work with what you've got and you move it in the right direction. As for who is the you that's going to benefit, put that aside. Remember, the Buddha doesn't talk about questions about if the self is or what the self is. He does talk about what the self does. The self can be its own mainstay. The self can be a governing principle. Because after all, what is your sense of self? It's a strategy for finding happiness. You realize that you have to take responsibility for your actions, and you have to look carefully at what you're doing and notice where you're causing unnecessary stress or where you're causing problems in life in general, and learn how not to do that. The Freudians talk about five functions of a healthy ego, and the Buddha teaches all five. He uses a different vocabulary, but he's talking about the same sorts of things. A healthy ego 
is a sense of anticipation. In other words, you see that there are future dangers, and so you prepare for them. Well, the Buddha calls that heedfulness. He says it's the basis for all skillful qualities. Healthy self realizes that if you try to find happiness for yourself and don't care about other people, it's not going to work. You have to think about other people's well-being. The psychologists call that altruism. The Buddha calls it compassion. You need to, have to learn how to say no to any unskillful impulses you may have. The Freudians call that suppression. It's not the same thing as repression. Repression is when you deny that something bad is there. Suppression is when you admit, freely admit that yes, there are unskillful things in the mind, but you've got to say no. The Buddha calls that restraint. And then you have to practice sublimation. In other words, you find other ways of channeling your desire for happiness in directions that are actually more skillful. The Buddha doesn't have a term for that, but he does talk about noticing how you're attached to sensuality and how un many unskillful things you can do based on that attachment. You can replace that with the pleasure that comes from concentration. And then the fifth healthy ego function is humor. We don't think of the Pali Canon as a humorous document, but that's because most of us don't read the Vinaya. The Vinaya has lots of good stories about people behaving in really silly ways, foolish ways. And they're often very funny. And you can see why they have stories like that in the Vinaya. They're trying to get you on the side of the rules. When you see that the behavior that is forbidden by the rules really is foolish. You're more willing to take on the rules. You realize that this was a set of rules that was established by someone with a sense of humor. It's not some misanthrope that's trying to make everybody miserable. And it teaches you to look at your own defilements and to learn how to laugh at them. That's a healthy ego function. There's another healthy function that the Buddha talks about that the Freudians don't talk about, and that's a healthy sense of shame. This is not the shame that's the opposite of pride. It's the shame that's the opposite of shamelessness. In other words, not caring what other good people might think about what your behavior is. And the point, of course, is you want to choose the right people. You want to choose the noble ones as the ones you want to look good in their eyes. They look at your behavior and they would approve of it. And so you think of doing things that they would disapprove of, and you say, no, I can't do that. I'd be ashamed to do that. Shame to have them see me do that. That's a healthy function of the mind, a healthy function of the self. So the Buddha does teach all these healthy self functions. And so it's a, simply a question of learning the right time and place to have an identity of me, the meditator, who's going to benefit from all this, and me, the meditator who's watching what's going on and can improve it. It's learning how to have the right sense of the right time and place. As I said, the Buddha doesn't talk about what yourself is or if it is, but he does talk about what it does, and one of its main functions is to exert control. And the question is, what things are worth trying to control and what things can you control? Obviously, the five aggregates are things you ultimately can't totally control, but you can squeeze them in the right direction enough to make a path. This is where the image of the raft comes in. As I mentioned last night, you're on this side of the river where there's danger, and you want to get to the other side, and there's no Nibbana yacht going to come and pick you up, take you over. So you've got to fashion the path out of what you've got here. And what have you got? You've got these five aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. The Buddha calls them twigs and branches. You bind them together as a path. And one of the ways of binding them together, of course, is to get the mind into concentration. 
You've got the form of the body, you've got the feeling of pleasure that you're trying to maintain, the perception of the breath that holds you with the breath, the fabrication of directed thought and evaluation as you keep thinking about the breath and evaluating how good it is and making adjustments. So it feels good breathing in, good breathing out, all the way in, all the way out. You can maintain that sense of well-being with the breath, and then let it spread throughout the body. And then there's consciousness, which is aware of all these things. So you can, can exert some control over the aggregates. If you couldn't exert any control, there would be no path. Discernment, right view, that's a matter of perceptions and thought fabrications. Right resolve, it's a matter of fabrications and perceptions. All the elements of the path, all the factors of the path, are composed of, of aggregates. So you learn how to develop the skillful ones. Let go of the unskillful things that would pull you away. And so you exert that ex extent of control. And in this stage of the path, you apply the perception of not-self to things that would pull you away from the path. The Buddha talks about this. There are things that would pull you away from your practice of the precepts. Right action, right, right speech, right livelihood. There's fear that you're going to suffer physically, you might damage your health, you might lose some of your wealth. In other words, if you're honest in your dealings with other people, there are people who engage in business and they lie and they get ahead. You can't do that. There may come times when the only way you're going to find any food is if you steal it. Well, you can't do that, so you have to go without. And there may be the other loss the Buddha talks about is loss of your relatives. You might To feed your relatives, you might have to steal, but you say, no, I can't steal even for them. So in cases like that, the Buddha has you reflect on how these things are not self. After all, they're going to go away anyhow. You're going to be separated from them anyhow. The things that are dangerous to lose, the Buddha said, are right view and, and your virtue. Because those things, it's not necessary that you have to lose them. You lose them only when you throw them away. So you hold on to them. You identify them as yours. And as for the things that would pull you away from the practice, you identify it as not-self. Because it's not worth trying to control. What is worth trying to control is your own behavior. That's where you want to focus your sense of self. So things that you can't control or things that are not worth controlling, you identify as not self. Notice that self and not self are value judgments. Is it worth it? When the Buddha gives that questionnaire to the that so often let the result in people's becoming fully awakened, went down the aggregates and said, Are these aggregates constant or inconstant? They're inconstant. You know, if something is inconstant, it's unreliable. Is it, is it stressful or eas easeful? Well, it's stressful. It's like a chair that, where the legs are not the same length. You sit on the chair and you have to be very tense in order to stay balanced. You build your house on sand. You have no idea when it's going to start tipping over. Notice he doesn't say impermanent. He says inconstant. These things are changing all the time. And so that for that reason, they're stressful. Then he asks, if something is inconstant and stressful, he doesn't say to come to the conclusion there is no self. The conclusion is, are they worth claiming as yourself? And as long as you haven't developed the path, you, you've got to hold on to the parts of the aggregates that are on the path. Let go of the ones that are not. And when you fully develop the path, that's when you let go of everything. That's when you apply the perception of not-self to everything that comes up. So there's a time and a place for self and not-self. 
and a lot of the skill and the practice is learning that sense of time and place. I've been reading a book on anthropology, and they talk about how for most of the history of the human race, people lived in different social arrangements in different seasons. Say if you're hunting and gathering, and that season when it's time to go out and hunt the animals, okay, the society would be organized in one way. You would have chiefs, you would have people who were in charge of the hunt, people organizing everybody else, people giving the orders. And then when the hunt was order, over, people would go back, and all of a sudden the chiefs weren't chiefs anymore. People who gave orders, people would laugh at them. And you grow up in a society like that, and you, you develop a sense of time and place. When, it, when is the time to be in charge? When is the time to abandon your sense of control? In, in modern society, we play the same roles year-round, year-round, year-round. We've lost that sense of learning how to take on a role and then put it down. But that's precisely what the Buddha is asking you to do. You are the person who's going to practice the path. You're the one who's going to benefit from it. As you focus not so much on you and focus on or what you are and what, what you can do. And so you do it without asking too many questions about who's doing it. And you find that you can do it. Then there will come a time when you don't have to do it anymore. You stop. And John Munn talks about nirvana as being the place of non-activity. There's nothing to do there. We talk about the duties of the Four Noble Truths, but what, and there is the duty of realizing unbinding. But once you've realized it, there's nothing more you have to do with it. It's there. It's outside of the Four Noble Truths. There are no duties with regard to it. But to get to that point, you have to learn your duties around self, your duties around not self. Focus on the doing. Years back, I knew of a Buddhist scholar who complained to me. I don't understand how the Buddha could have attained anything unconditioned. After all, we're conditioned beings. How can a conditioned being know anything unconditioned? I said, well, the problem is that you're defining yourself first. And once you've defined yourself, then you've placed limitations on you. The Buddha himself said that to define yourself is to place limitations on yourself. However you define yourself, there are things that self cannot do. So he left himself undefined. The question was simply, what can be done? Then he found that there is a path that can be followed and that leads to an experience of the unconditioned. So focus on the doing. Not on the what. As I told that scholar, he was like a person who could read only three letters at a time. He sees the word antelope and all he sees is ants. So he thinks the Buddha is talking about ants. And then you point out to him that, well, no, there's antelope. And he said, well, ants don't elope. That doesn't make any sense. He didn't appreciate the humor. But the point is, don't let your, the limitations of your imagination get in the way of doing the practice. Focus on what can be done, what you can do, and you'll find that your sense of what you can do is going to grow, and your sense of yourself will grow as well. I mean, this is how we develop a sense of self in that state of becoming. You take on an identity in a world of experience based around a desire. Say you have a desire for ice cream. If you don't know how to make ice cream, your sense of you will be different from the, the you who does know to, how to make ice cream. 
In the same way, the sense of the world will be different as well. If you don't know how to make ice cream, well, ice cream can be found in places where you buy it. That's the part of the world that's relevant. If you do know how to make ice cream, you know where the equipment is, you know where the ingredients are, your sense of the world will be different. So as you do the path, you find that your sense of yourself and the sense of the world are going to change, which is one of the reasons why the Buddha doesn't impose a definition on what you are. As he says, you're defining yourself. And for the time being, you want to do it in a skillful way, by developing skills. You're not focused so much on the self, but just focus on the skills that you can develop, and your sense of who you are and the sense of what's possible in this world will grow. And you get to something that doesn't require world and doesn't require self at all. That's when you can put everything down. Even when you put it down, though, if you're going to teach, you can pick it up to teach, but it's not for the purpose of your own well-being anymore, because you've found your well-being. You've found true well-being. Years back there was a controversy in Thailand about whether Nibbana was your true self or whether it was not self. It actually got in the newspapers. Can you imagine the newspapers in Canada? debating whether there is Nibbana is the self or not self. We actually had columns in the newspapers in Thailand devoted to this. So someone took the question to John Mahabua, asked him if Nibbana was self or not self, and he said Nibbana is Nibbana. Concepts of self and not self just don't apply. He says it's like you're taking excrement and trying to cover something really good. So when you reach Total awakening. Questions of self and not self are no longer important. Why you're on the path, they're part of the path. As he said, it's like the stairway going up to a house. You use your, your sense of self in a skillful way, you use your sense of not self in a skillful way. Gets you to the house. When you get in the house, you don't carry the, the stairway or the steps to the house uh, into the house. You leave them there. So that's where we're headed. But right now we're on the steps. So learn how to focus on the doing and the questions of what and whether what is or is not. Those get put aside, because after all you begin to see that even your sense of self is an activity. What the Buddha calls I making and my making. And you do it when it's skillful, you drop it when it's not. And that's how the unconditioned is found. And as the Buddha said, once that's found, there are no more questions. <laughs>